Well, I tell you what, when I was 25 years old, I'd been drunk all night, staying out all night partying, <clears throat> driving home early Sunday morning through a neighborhood, and I saw all these people going to church, walking down the street, almost like a Norman Rockwell thing. They were walking down the street, walking to, going, going into church. And I rolled my window down, said, you fools. You know the Lord has a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> he said, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, right. But you know, I tell you, God's getting, <clears throat> getting greater and greater in my life. The more and more and more of God and the power of God and the Holy Spirit working in my life. Because I believe that we ain't seen anything yet. Ooh, I'm telling you. Some people get so discouraged by what they see on television and all the things that are going on, you know, in the uh, government and all the things that, that have been declared. But I've got another declaration for you. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to just kind of kick this off tonight. I want you to turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 17, we're, we're going to do something here in a few minutes. I, I guess you'd call it practical. But I, I've got I've to share this with you, show you this from the Word. And if you'll stick with me and you'll stick with this meeting through Friday night, you're going to see God do something in your life. I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm just telling you. All you have to do is make up your mind, I'm not a one-night stand. <laughs> Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. Now, you know, I read some commentators, and they're right. You know, thank God it's a liberty from, from sin. We don't have to be bound by sin. And thank God when you make Jesus your Lord, you don't. But I'll tell you, that word is a big word. And it, and it really says that the Holy Spirit in your life brings power to produce freedom in every area of your life. Where the Spirit of the Lord is... There is freedom. Wherever you're bound, wherever you're hindered, wherever you can't make that next step or don't understand that next thing, the Spirit of the Lord is there to bring liberty. Wherever you're in bondage, whatever is holding you back, the Spirit of the Lord is there to bring you liberty, to set you free and to bring, listen to this, power into your life. Some people, even Christian people, are not plugged into the power source. In fact, they almost deny the Holy Spirit really has a place other than to say religiously something about the Holy Spirit. I can't do without Him. I have to have Him in my life. Now, this may be a shocker to you, but even Jesus could not live and operate without the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, that Jesus opened up the book of Isaiah, what we call chapter 1, and he began to read out of, out of that scripture. And it says in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now listen to this. And he has anointed me. You got it? The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me. Isn't that amazing that the Son of God 
came to this earth and submitted himself to the Holy Spirit. But he had to. Because he didn't come as the Son of God. He came as the Son of Man. And he had to show us how to operate in this world to the best of our ability. And the only way he could do it was to be like us. And there's a lot of other reasons, but that's what I want to show you tonight. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him because he anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. Let me just tell you this. I've heard people say, well, that means the gospel to the poor is you don't have to be poor no more. No, the gospel to the poor is you don't have to be judged by your poverty. You don't have to be judged by your poverty. Thank God Jesus was made poor that we might be made rich, and he will provide for us. But no person is judged by their poverty, by what they have or what they don't have. You, we're not judged by our wealth before God. Hallelujah. All right, I've got, I'm, I'm meddling. I'm going to go on here. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, here it is. Proclaim what? Liberty to the captives. Recovery of sight to the blind. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus was saying, I, I'm not doing this on my own. I am doing this by the power of the Holy Spirit. He working in me is doing this. Now, Hey, we can all we can say, oh yeah, that's wonderful. Absolutely. Amen. Thank God. That's true. Well, let me read you another scripture. John chapter 14, verse 16. Now listen to what it says. Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Now, now listen to me a minute. That sounds pretty benign. Another comforter. But when you look at it, that Jesus is making a powerful statement because the word in the Greek for another is w literally one just like me. An exact duplicate of me. Not the person of Jesus, the Son of God, but the power of the Holy Spirit upon him and who he was by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I'm not going to leave you helpless. I'm going to send you one just like me. And he will abide with you forever. Now listen to this. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. You better know there's a difference between you and the world. Amen. Listen to this. Because they neither see him nor know him. But you know him, now here it is, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I'm going to send you one just like me, and you know him because he's with you, but he's going to be in you. The whole premise of the New Testament is the Holy Spirit and his power in you. Jesus told the disciples, don't go anywhere, don't do anything until you are endued with power, until you have power in your life. He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, you've got to hang with me tonight because I'm going to show you something that will help you and it's going to help all of us. All right? So, Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, that the Lord is that Spirit. The Lord is that Spirit. They're, they're, they're together. They're one. Same power. Same anointing. Now, I understand. Listen, please don't misunderstand me. I understand that Jesus walked at a level you and I will never see. But that doesn't discount the fact that he gave us the same thing he had and operate in the same thing he operated in and walked in the same spirit that he walked in for our lives. The Spirit of God 
is a power producer. All right? So now listen to what it says. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5. Because the church had gotten away from the operation of the Spirit. They'd gone back over into works. Actually, some of, the, some of them had tried to get back under the, Judeo, Ju, uh, the, the, the Jewish laws. So Paul wrote them a letter. And he, ma he made a pretty, pretty profound statement in, in verse 3. He said, are you so foolish? Have you begun in the Spirit? Now you're going to go back over to the flesh? Are you so foolish? How stupid can you get? That's a paraphrase, but it, it'll work. <laughs> but listen to what the Amplified Bible says in verse, in verse 5. Does he who supplies you with his marvelous Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. He supplies us with his marvelous Holy Spirit. Now listen to this, and right along with that, and works powerfully and miraculously among us. Just stop right there. That's the comparison that Paul used with doing the works of the law. He said, hey, wait a minute. Didn't God supply you with his miraculous, marvelous Holy Spirit who works powerfully and miraculously among you? Folks, that hadn't changed. The Holy Spirit still wants to work marvelously and wonderfully and powerfully among us. We have a taste of it. We get glimpses of it. But he's the one that we have to depend on. Everywhere the Holy Spirit is, there's power. Now, I can only go by the book. I can't go by what people have justified why they don't have it say. All I can go by is what the book says. And the book says where you find the Holy Spirit, you find power. So I just made up my mind. I've got the Holy Spirit. I want power. Power for my life. Power to be a pastor. Power to communicate with you. Power for the Holy Spirit to break chains in your life. We see it. We got it. Glimpses. But we hadn't seen the fullness of it. Hebrews tells us that the end of this thing is that we're going to taste of the powers of the world to come. Woo, glory to God. That's where I want to be. Tasting of the powers of the world to come. But you read, you read in the Word of God and it makes me hungry for more, more, more of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 2 verse, says, verse 4 says, God bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Some people think just because they're not here, it ain't His will. That's not true. I found out there are a few variables there. One of them is how are you living your life. But you notice here, that God, it says that he works signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what we want. Over in Acts chapter 14 in verse 3, talking about Paul, it said, Therefore they stayed there a long time. There's our problem right there. We're not willing to stay a long time. Yeah. We won't even wait in line at McDonald's if it's over two or three minutes. <laughs> even if we've ordered, we'll leave. No, it says they stayed a long time speaking boldly in the, Lord, uh, in the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. 
Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 18, I won't dare speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word or deed to make the Gentiles obedient. I wish I could spend some time on that. You know how you make people obedient? How you draw them in? Signs and wonders. Listen to what it said. In mighty signs and wonders, here it is, by the power of the Spirit of God. By the power of the Spirit of God. You got it. I've got it. It's, it, it. It belongs to us. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit, listen to this, is given to each one. And it means each one, everyone. Well, what manifestation? Well, it's different with different people. But here's the good news. Here is the manifestation of the Spirit of God in your life. Yeah. It's there. It should be there. It should be part of your life. It's given to each of us for the profit of all. And then it gives nine gifts of the Spirit that are prevalent. Not just used to be one time. Now. Belong to us. I want them. I want them more. I want more. The Bible says you can desire the best gifts. Which one is that? The ones you need at the time you desire it. <laughs> One's given a word of wisdom by the Spirit. To another a word of knowledge to another, by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. Do you notice he keeps saying same Spirit, same Spirit, same Spirit, same Spirit. Healing. Same Spirit. Working of miracles. Same Spirit. Prophecy. Discerning of spirits. Same Spirit. Tongues. Interpretation of tongues. Verse. Now listen to this. Verse 11 says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Now you know, this is not a Baptist church. Okay, I just want you to know that. No, no offense, but you know, the Baptists have this thing about His will. Whatever happens is His will. So they figure, and I'm sorry to say it, but I know it's true because I've had them tell me this. Now, I know I'm not picking on but I love Baptists. I mean, we got, how many of you Baptist folks we have? See, we got Baptist people in church. So I'm not mad at them. But they're going to say amen to what I'm saying. Because basically, whatever happens is the will of God. You get run over by a Mack truck, it's the will of God. So if there are no gifts working, it's the will of God. But I said there's some variables there. And when you, when you step over into another place, you find out, you know, you can, you can stir up the Holy Spirit. Paul told Timothy, stir up, stir up. But now here's the thing I want you to see tonight, okay, because... You need, to, you need to read on because once we read that, we think, oh, yeah, well, they're the gifts of the Spirit. That's wonderful. But the next verse, verse 12, he hadn't changed subjects. He's given us the key to unlocking the flow of the gifts of the Spirit. One key. Now listen to what he says. For as the body is one and has many members... But all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now listen to this. For by one Spirit, how many spirits? One Spirit, we were all baptized into what? One body. And have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Now you want the gifts of the Spirit in operation you get a bunch of people that believe in the, in, in the body of Christ coming together. You believe in all of them drinking of the Spirit together, and all of a sudden you start finding the Holy Spirit's working. Why? Because the body's together. They're flowing together. Do you understand that tonight you're flowing together? I'm going to show you this. You're flowing together. The Living Translation says we all share the same Spirit. So if we all share the same Spirit, and we can get, all get on the same page with the same Spirit, all of a sudden things start happening. 
Well, one of the things that I found in the Word of God is when people gathered together, the Holy Spirit worked. You go read over in Acts chapter 1. Uh, it's talking about the day of Pentecost. It said when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in what? One place in one accord. Well, God would have done it anyway. I don't think so. Listen to me. When you get the body of Christ together and they're flowing together, I'm not through, so just stick with me here. You're going to start seeing God do, do more. Now, I, I can't do anything about people who don't believe the Spirit-filled life. They're not going to do what I'm asking you to do tonight. But you can. You can because you, you're part of the body. And we, listen to me, I'm going to show you this in the Word. We are the body tonight. Not, not the complete body, but, but we're, a, we're a chunk. Together. Right here, tonight. All right? You go, you go, and I'm not going to turn to these, but over in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, you know, they, they had, you know, been beaten for the gospel. They came back and told them what, what happened. And the Bible, the Bible says that with one accord, they all lifted up their voices unto God and began to pray. And you know what they prayed? Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders might be done by your son Jesus. Give us boldness to speak your word. And the Bible says, listen to me, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost fell. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, these were Spirit-filled believers, but there was a different unction there. And they began to speak the word with boldness. And it goes on to say, and with great power, the apostles gave witness of the resurrection. How come that happened? Because they were all there together. Over in Acts chapter 10, we find Cornelius, who was the first Gentile. Of the, to, to, because before him, the Jews, the, Peter, and they, they all thought that, hey, only Jews can be saved. This is a go, the gospel for the Jews. But all of a sudden, things started happening supernaturally. Peter ends up in a Gentile's house. by divine direction, and he marvels that, hey, I, I, I perceive God's not a respecter of persons. But here's the interesting thing. It says in Acts, chapter, in Acts chapter 10, in verse 27, it talks about this, and it says, and as he talked with him, he went in to Cornelius' house and found many who would what? Come together. So he said, well, I guess I'm going to preach to him. So he preached the same thing he preached on the day of Pentecost. Over in Acts, in, in, in Acts chapter, same chapter, over in verse 44, it says that, that while he was preaching, the Holy Spirit got so antsy. It says, while he was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Right in the middle of his message. The Holy Spirit just took over and fell. What happened? It says they all, now listen to this. This will blow your mind. This did not have anything to do with, you know, with, with, well, I wonder if it's the will of God. I don't know whether it's God's will or not. It says the Holy Ghost fell on them and heard the word, and they were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. How would they know it was poured out on them? Because they heard them speak with other tongues. How come that happened? Because they all gathered together. They all gathered together. Now, now I'm going to kind of jump here for a minute, and you're going to get it when I do this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and back, back up in verse 8, Paul said, How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious than the ministry of condemnation? One, one translation says it this way. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit's giving life? So I'm adding, I'm adding something here, and you're going to see it, but listen to me. So now we find out that there's greater glory, that God wants to do greater things, more things. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. All right? 
So we ought to expect it, right? We ought to expect the Holy Spirit to work. We ought to expect the Holy Spirit to do something. All right, well, now listen to what the Word says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Now listen to this. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now this is talking about you, all right? In whom the whole building being fitted together. You got it? Being fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Okay? You, you got that? You're not a holy temple on your own. You're part of a building. Okay? Well, what's the purpose? In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Do you know that God wants to dwell in our midst? Now see, I'm going to show you this in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament had glory because in the tabernacle, in the temple, God's glory would come down. Why are we expecting, because we have now the Holy Spirit, that God would do that for us? In a greater way, in a greater glory. To have that habitation dwelling not only in us, but on us. Psalm 26 verse 8 says, Lord, I love, now listen to this, the habitation of your house. And the place where your glory dwells. Whoo. Listen. We ought to reach out to people. We ought to touch people's lives. We ought to minister to people. But I want to tell you something. There are times when the glory needs to come in our house. It needs to come when we're here. It needs to be a part of what we do, who we are. Psalm 63 verse, verse 2 says, So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life, and my lips shall praise you. Psalm 77 verse 13 says, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is our great, who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. Where does he do them? In the sanctuary. You, O God, do wonders. You have declared your strength among the people, your people. I think sometimes, now don't misunderstand what I'm, we get so outreach minded, we, we, we forget about the glory of the tabernacle, of the temple. Because I'll tell you, when you walk out with glory, you're going to do a lot more. God's going to work and you're going to do a lot more in your life. Now let me say it this way, all right? There is still temple glory. And I want this house Tonight, to have it in a greater measure. You say, well, you can't just demand that. I can't demand it, but I found a way to get it. So tomorrow night, I'm going to tell you, no, we're going to do it tonight. (laughs) The enemy will try to separate us from the glory. Now listen to me that comes when we come together. And he tries to do it by individualism. And individualism is when you're not willing, now don't get mad at me, when you're not willing to be a part of what God's doing, you want to do what you want to do. Sometimes you need to set aside what you want to see God's glory, to see what God wants. In your life. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, this is a good, this is a good pastor scripture right here. It's, listen to what it says. It says, Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Do you know that the Bible says the clo- it says here the closer we get 
to the end, the more important it is. Why? Because there's greater glory. God's wanting to do more. And so when we have come together and we allow that habitation of the Spirit, all of a sudden things start multiplying. God starts working, and God starts doing things in a greater way. So don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. Even when this was written, there were people, the message translation said, who were avoiding worshiping together. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. That word assembling means to go together with to the meeting place. To go together with who? Your neighbor. Where? To the meeting place. Why? Because there's still temple glory. There's still glory in the house. And the, I read you the scripture. I, I said it was a little different. If the Old Testament had it, how much more? Those who have the Spirit, who are being built up as a temple unto the Lord for His habitation. Now that's different than the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. That can only happen when you come to the meeting place. People just got out of the habit of worshiping together. And so the power of God waned in the church. Then you have to try to manufacture it or make it something it's not. When really, listen, I found out, and, and I, I had an experience with God I'm not going to relate to you tonight. I found out that if I just let God have it, He'll do it. He'll do it. When you have a bunch of people like you're here tonight that are hungry for God and want to see God's glory, He'll do it. So, if it, there was glory in the old, how much more in the new? Well, let's just see what happened in the old. Over in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 11, it says they were dedicating the temple, the tabernacle. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the most holy place. For all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without, uh, without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites who were the singers. Wait a minute. Singers? They're, they're part of this? And all those of Asaph and Heman and Jedithun with their sons and their brethren stood at the east end of the altar clothed in white linen having cymbals. Hey, we got cymbals. <laughs> Stringed instruments. We got some of those. We might be able to do this. We might be able to pull this off. <laughs> Harps. And with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers, now here it is, were as one. To make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord when they lifted up their voices with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good. For his mercy endures forever. That the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. So that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now that's... That's not as good as what we've got. Shouldn't we expect at least that? Now, the glory of God, hey, it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. 
So Moses said, well, I'm going to let my goodness pass by you. My goodness pass by you. Now that sounds pretty, oh, God's good. God's good. <laughs> well, Jesus demonstrated that goodness. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says how God anointed, y'all still here? Jesus of Nazareth. Y'all still with me? With what? The Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good. And doing what? Healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So goodness is not just something you say. Goodness is something that is expressed by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. So I found a secret. I found out that if you get a bunch of people together who want to worship God, and they want to lift their voice in unison in one accord unto God, that God will then start working His glory and manifest His power in the midst of that to minister to the people that are there. Now, if you want to be selfish and say, oh, God, do something, do something, then you're going to probably miss out on what God really wants because what He wants you to do is get hooked up and yes, worship. Now, now, listen, you have to understand something about me. I can't sing a lick. You don't want to hear me sing. But I found out you don't have to be a singer to worship. I found out that I can worship God and I can magnify God and man, I can go right along with, the, with the, whatever the instruments and whatever they're singing. And, 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 and I'll tell you, if you do that, God takes care of the rest. Then His presence, then His glory begins to work. And I was praying this afternoon specifically because I wanted, I said, God, you got to do something. Becky, y'all, come on. I said, I want, to do, I want to start this thing off with your presence. And I want you to do something. And it's clear as a bell, I heard the Lord say to me, I want to heal tonight. Yes, Lord. See, that's part of His glory. Yes, Lord. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and what? Healing. That came out of God's goodness. That came out of His goodness. Now, what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the, I'm going to gather the singers. I found out it works. <laughs> now, you know, let, let me just tell you this. There are other things that come out of this. I mean, let me give you an example. Tomorrow night, we, we, Dr. Mark Barkley is going to be here. He, he operates in the office of a prophet. Well, you start getting worship up here and the glory of God up here with a prophet, and all of a sudden, they start saying stuff. They start seeing stuff. Different operation, same glory. But see, I can't do it by myself. It's, I can't preach you into this. I can give you the information, and then you got to say, you know what, I'm going to do that. Well, you know, it's getting late. I don't want to tell you, it's getting late. Well, listen, I don't mean to be ugly, but just go on home. But, but i tell you what. I, I don't want to see you miss the glory of God. I, I missed it once in my life since I've been a Christian. And I made up my mind I ain't leaving again to the last man standing. I am not leaving. I'm going to be where God is. I'm going to be in His presence. I want to see God do something. And I want to be a part of it. Well, you know, I got, I got to go to work in the morning. You used to party all night and get up and go to work. Don't give me that. But I mean, these, these meetings are not, they're not here designed to have a cute little sermon and quit. We want God's glory. We want His presence. We want it. We want it. 